Hi, my name is Corey Holm, and I'm a CG specialist here at Chaos Group. Today, I'm very excited to present to you our next generation renderer, V-Ray Next for SketchUp. Together, we'll explore how V-Ray Next's smart new features and performance optimizations can speed up your renders and streamline your workflow while delivering stunning looking images right out of the box. In V-Ray Next, you'll also find many new features, including an extensive new asset library manager, which makes working with assets in your scene much more intuitive, as well as deeper SketchUp integration with new tools for making adjustments to your scene and lighting quickly. We've also incorporated powerful new scene intelligence features like the V-Ray Adaptive Dome Light to automatically speed up your renders. In addition, we also offer support for new GPU production features, such as blazing fast rendering of volumetric effects like fog. All combined, V-Ray is now better, smarter, and faster than ever before. To get started, let's explore some updates we've made to the user interface, where I'll demonstrate how V-Ray Next can improve your workflow. Okay, I have a scene here containing two small house-shaped objects without any material supplied to them. Let's first take a look at the updated asset editor in V-Ray Next, and I'll introduce you to some of the shortcuts and specifics of navigating your scene's hierarchy. Let's click on the V-Ray icon to open up the V-Ray asset editor. At the top of the asset editor here, you'll see that we have a row of icons. Some of them are in blue, while others are grayed out, which indicates that they don't contain any data. In this scene, all of the icons are grayed out except the lighting and a new textures tab we've added in V-Ray Next. The lights icon here is blue because we have a V-Ray sunlight already set up by default. We also have an environment sky by default, which you'll see if I click on the new textures tab over here. Together, the sun and sky represent the V-Ray sun and sky system, which is connected to the SketchUp shadows tray over here on the right and can be controlled from there. Next, right-clicking on each category at the top opens a drop-down menu to access other assets. For categories that do not contain any items yet, I can also just simply left-click to activate the drop-down. In V-Ray Next, we also have two new tabs available to choose from, the Render Elements tab and the Textures tab. Let's add the Global Illumination Render Element. Now you'll see that both the Render Elements and the Textures tabs are blue, indicating visibility for both categories of assets listed below. If I click on the Geometry tab, let's also add one of the Geometry options to the scene, such as a V-Ray Infinite Plane. In V-Ray Next, you can also easily choose which different categories to view, simply by using the Control key to select a combination of them. Or, we can easily view them all at once by using the shortcut Control a Now, you'll see here that we still have one inactive tab, the Materials tab. Let's quickly explore a different way that we can create materials in V-Ray Next. If I select a material, let's say this Pavers Flagstone Gray material, and apply it to the house, you can see that the material has been added to the asset editor as well, so that we can then further modify it. I'll demonstrate modifying materials in V-Ray Next a bit later. For now, let's click on the Materials tab icon up here to see only our materials in the scene. And if we right-click, you'll see that there is a list of materials here that I can create. For example, there are a lot of different utility materials to choose from, but most of the time, you'll probably want to use the generic material. Note that if I hold Control and click on any option in the drop-down menu, I'll be able to add multiple assets without closing the menu itself. I can now easily click and select the materials, or hold Shift to select a range of assets, such as all three generic materials I just created. If you've used previous versions of V-Ray and are used to creating materials already using the button at the footer of the asset editor, you can still click the plus icon down here as well. Here, you'll find the same categories that we have listed at the top. Next, in the panel on the left, you'll see the library of material options available, as well as a new creation menu to the left. If I twirl down the arrow, you'll see once again that it has the same categories available as are listed in the previous two options. Using this menu, you can quickly preview specific categories or see all of them together. You can also easily use the search tab to search for any specific types of assets. For example, if I type Bezier, you'll see that I'm offered the option to create a Bezier curve. And if I type Metallic, I can search for a PBR material. If you don't want to create materials from scratch, then you can easily use our material library. The material library is conveniently organized into subfolders just like in the Create menu, 
so that you can preview all of the materials together at once or use the Search tab again to filter for specific materials. For example, I'll search for a parquet material. Now you'll see we get a bunch of different options, and if I hold Shift, I can then select a range of multiple materials at the same time, then add all of them to my scene here together by right-clicking and choosing Add to Scene. And once more, if I hold Shift to select the assets I just added, I can press Delete and remove them. Together, you can use whichever functionality for creating assets and materials that you find most convenient to help you work faster and without any hassle. One of Vray Next's new and very useful features is the option to load a custom library. If I click the little folder icon in the bottom left here, I can select and load in a folder prepared in advance. In this case, I'll select the folder called Custom Library, which contains a bunch of VR map files I've already organized in advance. Looking at the custom library I've loaded in here, you'll see that I have also saved different types of assets such as lights and render elements. All of these assets can be used to create templates which can be imported into other projects or even shared between colleagues. For example, you can have network locations allowing for a single unified library for all members of a team to access. I can then right click on an asset such as this wood planks material for example and then I can add it to my scene or apply it to the selected object. In this case, let's choose apply to selection. Now, you'll see that the wood planks material has appeared on the house, and it has also been added automatically to the asset outliner as well. One thing to note here is that if you were to apply this wood planks material to another object using the library menu on the left, this would create a duplicate wood planks material in the outliner. If you simply wish to apply the exact same wood material to multiple objects, then you should right click on the material in the outliner and apply it from there after you've brought it over from the library. This way, any changes to the material will affect all of the objects that it is applied to. We now have a unified way of displaying assets in the project. As you can see, the top of this menu displays a live swatch for the selected asset. Any changes we make to the material will be updated in the preview above, so that you can quickly get a sense for how the material will look when rendered. For example, let's drop down the reflection menu here and slightly increase the reflection color parameter a bit. Now I'll close the right-hand flyout menu and let's drag and drop the adjusted wood planks material back into the custom library I've got here. You'll see that a warning pops up asking me if I want to replace the original one in my library, which I can click on to accept the replacement. Otherwise, we can right click on the wood planks material in the outliner and choose save as. This will then allow me to save it as a new material to my custom library or to another location. In this case, I don't need to, so let's move on and close the left hand flyout menu and then reopen the one on the right. Now let's explore some of the options available for creating a material ourselves, using some of the new tools in V-Ray Next. I'm going to right click on the Materials tab and add a generic material. Let's rename this to Marble Tiles. And if you want, when working with materials, you can easily adjust the size of the live preview swatch by clicking and dragging on this bar here. Up here in the right hand corner, we also have a drop down menu we can select to change the preview display mode of the preview itself. In this case, let's switch it over to the wall close-up mode just to make it more convenient when working with this material in particular. Down here just below the swatch, we can toggle between basic or advanced settings from the material parameters as well. As the name suggests, basic mode will hide some of the settings available in advanced mode. Next, I'm going to right click on the diffuse texture swatch and then load in a bitmap. Once that's loaded in, let's click on the up arrow here to move back up one level in the hierarchy. You can also click on the left pointing arrow to switch between the current and previously selected asset. In addition, you can use shortcuts in place of these by pressing the control key and then the left or up arrow respectively, which works the same as these icons. Next, I'm going to click the pen icon in the top left corner so that the live preview swatch stays pinned to the marble material. This will let me make changes to other specific parameters of the material while monitoring how they affect the overall material's appearance in the preview swatch. Okay. Let's right click on the diffuse texture swatch again, and this time I'm going to go into the wrap in submenu here and select the Bezier curve. The wrap in option allows you to quickly put a new texture in the texture slot and place the original texture within the new texture. This makes it easy to plug one texture into another one. The Bezier curve texture allows you to remap any texture color values using RGB or Luminance Bezier curve controls. We can work with RGB, but in this case I want to switch the mode to mono. To make changes to the graph, simply click to create a control point 
and then drag it around to find a position that creates the desired results. Thanks to the Live Swatch preview, we can easily monitor the effect these controls have on the material result. In this case, I want to make the marble pattern appear a bit lighter and less contrasty. As you can see, using V-Ray Next's new curve options, we can create a variety of different looks using only one bitmap. We can also change the tangent type mode from None to Free. This will give us additional handles we can then adjust independently of one another, giving us even more fine-tuned control over the Bezier curve and its effect on the material. I'll make a few more adjustments here with it until I find something that I like. Okay, that looks pretty good. Now, when I'm done making changes, I can click on the shader's name up top next to the pen, which will return me to the material parameters of whatever I have pinned here, in this case, the marble material. In very next, the outliner has a new structure, which displays the hierarchy for everything that exists within each shader, so that you can get a sense of what each shader contains without having to go into individual texture slots. You can see this here simply by clicking on the drop-down arrows in the outliner. These new drop-down menus are collectively known as the Asset Tree View, and it is available for lights, geometries, render elements, and textures as well, providing a simple and unified way to visualize shader hierarchies throughout V-Ray Next. It also makes it easier to navigate between textures much more quickly, and allows you to copy and instance the textures between different materials or assets more easily than before. We can now drag and drop assets we've already used. For example, I can drag and drop down the bitmap texture into the Reflection Colors texture slot and paste it as a copy. Once again, I can then right-click on the texture slot and go into the Wrap-In menu, and this time I'm going to choose the Spline Curve tool. The Spline Curve graph enables us to easily adjust the hue, saturation, and value parameters for the texture without any hassle or need to open up another software. Let's first switch to the Saturation graph here and drag the graph all the way down to the bottom right corner in order to desaturate it, since reflection maps should be in grayscale. Next, I'll switch to the value graph, and let's make some adjustments to the reflectivity of the marble material's veins. We can also unpin the marble tile, so we can actually see how this graph slider is affecting the texture map. Here you can see that moving the control points makes the appearance of the marble veins either darker or lighter. White areas mean they are the most reflective, and the darkest areas will be the least reflective. In this case, having the veins slightly less reflective will make the marble look pretty realistic for our scene. Okay, let's press the up arrow to jump back up in the hierarchy and see how that looks. And I'm pretty happy with that. Let's also maybe reduce the reflection glossiness just a tiny bit as well here. Okay, next, let's scroll down and add a bit of bump to the material by toggling the bump and normal mapping switch on. Here again, Viri Next's new Asset Tree interface makes it incredibly efficient to work with multiple copies of texture maps so that you can quickly make customizations to your materials with ease. Let's click on the texture slot to make some changes using the spline curve here once again. I'll just pull back the dark values some to remove any gray values and add some more contrast. Pressing the up arrow again, you can see now that the bump effect is more subtle. Now we can finish polishing it by dragging the amount slider down some. Okay, I'm liking how that looks. Now, to organize my maps a bit better and make things easier to work with, I can select the spline curve in the asset tree and double click to rename it. In this case, I'll just call it Bump. I'll do the same for the other two maps I created for the reflection and diffuse textures as well. All right, now I can close up the dropdown arrows and select the marble tiles material once more I think that looks ready to use, so let's open the left-hand flyout menu and just drag and drop the material into the custom library to save it. Now you can see that it's listed there in the custom library, and it's ready to be used in any other projects I import the library into. In fact, we'll use it again soon in the upcoming interior scene. Meanwhile, if someone else on my team is working on a project using the same custom library and adds their own material to it, all I would have to do is right-click on the custom library and choose Refresh, to load in the latest asset files they've added. This option to refresh an open library is especially helpful when you have a project with the library already open. If someone from your studio is adding new assets to the library from somewhere else, you can easily refresh it and load them in. Okay, now that you've seen how the new asset outliner and UI can improve your workflow, let's move on to an interior scene I've prepared to demonstrate creating a few materials. Here I have a nice minimalist modern kitchen scene. To get started, Let's open up the V-Ray Asset Editor, and in the Settings tab, I'm going to turn on the Denoise Toggle Switch. 
This will enable the denoiser render element so that we can see a faster preview with less noise. In V-Ray Next, we have two different denoiser engines at our disposal, the default V-Ray denoiser and the new NVIDIA AI denoiser. For the denoiser to update as often as possible, you can set the update frequency rate to 100. The NVIDIA AI denoiser uses an AI-based denoising algorithm to denoise the image very fast, which is why it's great for getting a quick preview of your scene. Keep in mind that the NVIDIA AI denoiser does require an NVIDIA GPU to work, regardless of whether you're rendering on GPU or CPU. You'll see that after only a few seconds, the noise almost completely vanishes, and we're given a preview of our scene that will continue to sharpen up as we leave the render processing. Notice also that the scene does not currently have any specific materials other than this generic material which has been applied to all of the objects. So I'm going to close the VFB and head over to the Materials tab in the Asset Editor. Let's pop open the left-hand flyout menu, and in the Custom Library section, I'm going to drag the Marble Tiles material that we created just a bit ago into my Outliner's Materials category menu. Now, let's apply the marble material in the scene. I'll just right-click on the Marble Tiles material and choose Apply to Selection to apply it. You can see a texture helper is displayed on the wall in the viewport, because the diffuse map is being passed through color corrections. To see the marble material in the viewport, we can drop down the binding rollout of the marble material and switch the texture mode to custom. Then, using the asset tree dropdown, I can simply drag and drop the marble's diffuse map as an instance into the binding texture slot. Now you'll see that the marble material is displayed in the viewport. I also need to make sure that the material has the correct size information, which I can do in the materials tray on the right. In this case, let's drop down the size a bit. When working on your own scenes, you'll typically need to experiment to find what size works best for the texture you've applied. In this case, I've gone ahead and tested this beforehand and found that this size works best. Now I'm going to head over to the Materials Library and search for Parquet to pull up some of the different wood flooring options included with V-Ray. In this case, I'm going to select the Flooring Parquet Parallel material, and this time I'll just right-click it and choose Add to Scene to move it into my Materials category. Next, I'll select the floor in the scene here, and then right-click on the Flooring Parquet material and choose Apply to Selection. Once again, I need to adjust the texture's scale. This time, I'll increase it to 240 centimeters since I know this value works well for the scene. You might notice that the Materials Library also includes its own suggestions, but these are not mandatory values, so you should feel free to experiment to find what looks good. Now that we've added these two materials, let's start an interactive render to see how the scene looks so far with the changes we've made. Once again, you'll see the AI denoiser quickly kicking in here to clean up the noise in our scene, so we can get a very fast preview of how the scene looks with the materials. I'll let this render finish here just so we can see it a bit sharper, and I'm liking how that looks so far. Okay, let's go ahead and close the frame buffer now, and I'm going to switch over to the vases scene perspective here, so we can explore some of the new options available in V-Ray Next for creating metallic materials. To start, I'm going to right-click on the Materials tab here, and add a metallic material to my Materials category below. In V-Ray Next, the new metallic material is compatible with PBR workflows, which are commonly used with tools such as Substance Designer. Let's open the flyout menu here on the right and import some texture maps that use the popular metalness roughness workflow, and I'll demonstrate how they can easily be set up for rendering in V-Ray Next. In this case, I'm going to use the maps from a PBR shader for corroded metal that I found online from freepbr.com, but you can use this workflow for any PBR compatible texture maps that you create or download. To start, I'm going to right click on the color texture slot and select bitmap. Now you'll see in my PBR folder here that I've got four PBR maps prepared, the base color, metallic map, normal map, and roughness. Since we're first adding a texture to represent the metal's color, I'm going to select the base color map. Now I'll press the up arrow to hop back into the material's parameters. Next, I want to add the metalness map, so I'm going to right-click on the metalness texture swatch and choose bitmap once again. After choosing the metallic map, I'm also going to need to adjust the file's color space. In this case, let's change it to Rendering Space Linear. The basic reason for doing this is to prevent any gamma correction from being applied to the texture files before shading, since it's typical and more realistic to shade PBR textures in linear space. 
This topic is a bit too complex to discuss in detail during this webinar, but the important takeaway here is that PBR texture maps for metalness, roughness, and normals will typically look the most realistic when the color space is set to linear. Next, I want to adjust this metalness texture a bit to remove any gray values from the texture. In general, metalness is a black and white state, meaning a material is either a non-metal or metal, represented here by either a value of 0 or 1. Gray values resting somewhere in between 0 and 1 do not correspond to any physical materials. To remove any gray values from the texture, I'm going to right-click on the same metalness texture swatch. I'm then going to navigate to the Wrap-In menu, and this time find the Spline Curve option. This will allow me to make some additional tweaks to the metalness map's values. To remove the gray, let's select the value parameter and scroll down to change the interpolation mode to none. The interpolation modes basically offer various ways to modify the curve's shape between control points. You can see in the live preview how the texture map is affected based on whether I slide it up and down or to the left and right. Next, I'm once again going to use the pin icon in the top left corner so that the live swatch preview stays pinned to the metallic material. That way, if I go back into the texture map and adjust the spline curve, I can easily observe how these changes affect the overall appearance of the material. You'll notice that as I move to the left, the material's corrosion lessens, and if I move to the right, the corrosion becomes more apparent. Let's leave it in the upper right corner here, and then move on to the next map. Now, I'm going to right-click to add a bitmap to the roughness texture slot, and choose the roughness map I have here. Once again, I'll change the color space to Rendering Space Linear. Returning back to the metallic material, let's now turn on the Bump and Normal Mapping toggle and switch the mode to Normal Map. I'll then add a bitmap, select the Normal Map, and change the color space to Linear once more. Now let's go back to the material parameters again, and I'm going to bring down the amount to something like 0.2 so that the bump effect is less dramatic. Next, I'm also going to add a wrap-in color correction to the color slot's texture as well. This will allow me to make quick adjustments to the overall appearance and saturation of the corrosion. Okay, I'm liking the preview I have here, so let's go ahead and apply the material to the vases and see how it looks in a render. I'll select the vases here, and then right-click on the metallic material and choose Apply to Selection. Now in the Materials tray on the right, Let's also adjust the size parameters. I'm going to scale this down to about 1.5 centimeters, which I know works well for these small vases. I'm also going to turn off the denoiser here, because otherwise we'll lose the small details that I want to inspect. Now let's go ahead and close the asset editor, and I'm going to go ahead and start a render so you can see what the material looks like. Okay, and now you've seen how easy it is to set up PBR shader maps using V-Ray Next and create incredibly realistic looking metallic materials. Now, let's return back to the main scene here and explore how we can import complex geometry into SketchUp with proper UVs. We know that it's a common workflow for a lot of users to import assets from other applications like 3ds Max or receive assets from colleagues created in different software. As a result, I want to walk you through some of the new possibilities available for these kinds of scenarios when working with the VR Scene Importer. First, I have a scene here in 3ds Max that contains a few chairs, a set of apples, and a tray that have all been modeled, UV unwrapped, and textured in 3ds Max. Before we export them, I'm first going to make sure that I hide everything that I don't want to export from the scene, since it will always export the whole scene, except for anything that is hidden. Once I've done that, I'll right-click to export them as a VR scene. Now, all we have to do is select a file path, and then just click Export, and that's it. It's that easy and simple. To save time, I've also already exported the chairs in advance, so let's hop back over into SketchUp now to see how easily we can import them into our scene. Okay, I've now pulled up a similar version of the previous SketchUp scene we were working in, only this time, all of the individual materials have already been applied to the objects here in the scene. Now let's see how we can bring over the apples, tray, and chairs that we exported as VR scenes from 3ds Max. To start, let's go to File, Import, 
and then switch the file type to V-Ray VR Scene Files from the drop-down list. Let's first select the kitchen chairs, but before importing them, I'm going to click on the Options button to review our settings for importing. Let's change the Materials option to Colors to import only the diffuse color, since we don't have any special textures or UVs to worry about here. Once the chairs are loaded into the scene, you'll see that with V-Ray Next, VR scenes imported this way are not baked, allowing us to easily make further adjustments to them to suit our scene. For example, selecting the VR scene here, I can select the chair body and the legs of the chair and easily rotate it around or position it elsewhere in the scene. Alright, let's undo that, and then once again, I'll select another chair on the right here as well just to show you I can make changes or even delete it. Okay, let's undo that now and then close the group. Next, let's go to File, Import, and select the Kitchen Apple set to import them into the scene here as well. This time, I'm going to click Options and then change the Materials mode to Textures and UVs since I want to import the apples with their proper UVs and textures. Now, the apples have been imported into the scene here so let's switch over to the close-up scene to see them better. Okay, now I'm going to start the interactive render so we can see how the textures look on the apples and the plate that we imported. And as this loads, we'll see the NVIDIA AI Denoiser kick in again. With Fury Next, importing geometry and textures from other applications is more flexible than ever and makes it easy to work with complex geometry and UVs without any hassle in SketchUp. Just import them and click Render, and you can have great looking results right out of the box. Alright, now let's close the frame buffer, and switch our perspective over to the picture scene here. I'm going to open up the Asset Editor, and select the currently applied material, Coffee Set Gray. I want to change it to something darker, like this Coffee Set Glossy material for example. Normally, to apply this to the pictures here, I can select the group and then right click on the Coffee Set Glossy material and choose Apply to Selection. However, when I do this this time, you'll notice that the material does not seem to apply, as the material does not update in the viewport. For situations like this, we can use the New Scene Interaction tool located in the top right of the toolbar here to take a look at the object's material inheritance. In order to understand how this tool works in a bit more detail, I've created a separate scene here to demonstrate its functionality. Let's hop over to it now and take a look at a few different ways that we can use the Scene Interaction tool to our advantage, as well as handle default texture placement on objects imported into SketchUp. Okay, I've got a little scene here with a few objects that I've imported into SketchUp. To start, let's first take a look at the UVs here and see how Vary Next can improve our workflow. As you can see, the material didn't apply well since there are no proper UVs. In V-Ray 3.6, as well as V-Ray Next, I can right-click and head down to the V-Ray UV Tools menu, where you'll find a list of options here for fixing these UVs. In V-Ray Next, we've now made these UV tools easier to find by adding them to the toolbar in the top right for quick access. As you can see, as soon as I click the button, the texture preview updated instantly to reflect the new UVs. Next, if I select another material, let's say this asphalt stamped brick material, and try to apply it to the sphere, you'll notice that nothing about the sphere's appearance changes. This is because the paver's brick material has been assigned to the sphere's face, but the asphalt material has been assigned to the sphere's group. Just like in SketchUp, Viri will prioritize the face material assignment over a group material. You can confirm this up here in the Entity Info tray, where you'll see that the asphalt appears for the group. In order to apply the asphalt to the sphere, I just need to make sure that the sphere's group is selected and remove all the materials on it. To do so, I'm going to click on the new button we've added to remove materials up here in the top right. And let's give it a moment here to load. Okay, and now we can see that the sphere has turned white, indicating that all the materials have been removed. This time, the sphere updates to reflect the new material indicating that we've successfully applied the asphalt to the sphere's group. All right, now let's move on to the next scene here. In Vray Next, we've introduced the brand new scene interaction tool 
to make navigating and inspecting a scene's object hierarchy easier than ever. To show you how navigating the object hierarchy works, I have a group here containing two groups within for each little house. If I click on either house, you can see that they are grouped together and have no materials supplied to them. And I'll show you how the Scene Interaction tool can conveniently display this information. When I select it up here in the top right corner, a set of circular rings will appear when I hover over any object in my scene. Each separate ring here represents a level in the object's group hierarchy, with the innermost ring representing the object's face that my cursor is hovering over. I can easily navigate up the group hierarchy by holding down the Shift key and moving the mouse outwards towards the next ring. Once my cursor enters a new ring, you'll see the boundary box shift from the face on the house to the whole house. Still holding Shift, if I move my cursor into the outermost ring, you'll see the boundary box shifts to highlight the entire group. This allows you to very easily see the hierarchy of the objects and navigate between them, which is especially useful for more complex scenes containing a lot of geometry and groups. Okay, let's move on to the next scene, and I'll now show you how the Scene Interaction tool can be used to inspect your objects in a more complex scenario, and I'll also inspect the material hierarchy as well. If I hover over this house on the left, you'll notice two small colored circles in the middle at the top. These circles correspond to the material inheritance in this house's hierarchy. The top circle, which is purple and intersects the outermost ring, is applied to a group containing both this house and the pink house on the right. The lower circle, which intersects the middle ring, represents a wooden material, which is applied to this house specifically, which you can see. Now, if I hover over this house on the right and move my cursor over the pink roof, you'll see that an additional pink semicircle has appeared intersecting with the innermost ring. This indicates that this pink material has been assigned to the front face of the roof, while the semicircle means that the back of the face just has the group's wooden material assigned. Meanwhile, the three rings indicate the face I'm hovering over, the group it belongs to, in this case the house, and the main group that the house belongs to. Again, to switch between the hierarchies, all I have to do is simply hold Shift and move the mouse towards the respective ring. Then, while holding Shift, I can click on the ring to switch to the corresponding group, which is indicated by the additional boundary box that appears. Now that we've got the outer ring for the entire group selected, you can also see over in the Entity Info panel tray that the purple material is showing, indicating that it has been applied to this entire group. Okay, now that you've seen how the Scene Interaction tool works and how it can easily navigate your scene and material hierarchy, let's return back to our kitchen scene. Alright, back in our interior scene here, let's review how we can apply the Coffee Set Glossy material to the pictures here like I wanted to earlier. Before applying the material, I want to remove the existing material that's assigned to the pictures, as we saw in the previous scene with the houses. Now, we'll wait just a moment for it to update. Okay, and now you'll see that the picture materials have become white in the viewport, indicating that the material has been removed. Now we can go ahead and apply the Coffee Set Glossy material to the pictures. To do so, I'll open the Asset Editor, right-click on the Coffee Set Glossy material, and then choose Apply to Selection. Okay, now that we've got that applied and have discussed importing VR scenes and adjusting materials, let's switch scenes here over to our main scene and explore the lighting. Okay, back in our kitchen scene here, let's navigate outside of the scene and head to the Lights tab in the Asset Editor. Currently, the scene is lit using the V-Ray Sun and Sky system in combination with three light portals which you can see from the outside here. If I select them and open the right-hand flyout menu, you'll see that these are just rectangular lights with the light portal checkbox enabled. A common workflow in previous versions of V-Ray was to use light portals to bring in light from the outside into an interior. Now in V-Ray Next, we can just use the V-Ray Adaptive Dome Light and save time. Let's go ahead and try using the dome light, but instead of using an HDRI, I'm going to use the environment sky with it. You'll see that the dome light now appears in the list of lights in the Asset Editor, which includes a texture bitmap in it by default. First, you should see by default that the Adaptive checkbox is checked, so that you can take advantage of the new Adaptive Sampling algorithm built into V-Ray Next. The dome light's new Adaptive algorithm can speed up your renders by up to 7 times depending on the scene, while also removing the need for skylight portals, 
thanks to its intelligent sampling method, which automatically figures out which portions of the environment to sample and which ones to ignore. To test this out, let's go ahead and right click on the rectangle light here to remove the skylight portals. Next, let's control click on the textures tab to view it in the outliner as well, and then drag and drop the environment sky texture into the texture swatch and choose paste as instance. This way, if we were to copy it and make adjustments to the sky texture, all copies of it will be updated automatically. Okay, now let's go to the settings tab and drop down the environment menu. The adaptive dome lights algorithm is very fast and can speed up rendering the sky as well. So I'm gonna uncheck the background checkbox now that we're plugging the sky into the dome light instead. This way, the adaptive dome light can speed up your render even if you're not using an HDRI. Okay, now let's start another interactive render and let's see how our scene looks using the new adaptive dome light with an environment sky. We'll see the AI denoiser kick in here to help give us a fast preview again. Okay, to make it a bit easier to directly compare the results between our previous setup and the adaptive dome light, I already saved two previous renders in the history here. I'll do a quick A-B comparison so you can see the difference, with the adaptive dome light render being on the right. Overall, the results are quite similar, but you can see that the adaptive dome light rendered in nearly half the time about 2 minutes and 30 seconds, versus the original 4 minutes and 30 seconds. It also required less manual effort, since I didn't need to spend any time setting up light portals. Okay, I'm going to turn off the comparison, and let's close the history channel. Now, let's close the VFB, and open up the asset editor. I'm also going to head over to the right to drop down the shadows tray, and click the display shadows button here, so that we can get a sense of which parts of our scene are in sunlight. Next, let's head to the Render Elements tab and right-click on the menu and scroll down to find the option for Lighting Analysis. Let's add this render element to the list so I can show you how you can use it to measure and analyze the light levels in your scene. Now, in the Flyout menu on the right, you'll see here that there are some different parameters and display modes we can choose from. For example, at the moment we're set to analyze the render using Lux values. We can also choose to display the result in false colors, as seen in the live swatch preview represented by a gradient. We could also switch to the grid overlay mode, which positions distinct grid points over the frame. In this case, I'll stick with the false colors mode, and also check on the draw legend option, which will display a map legend of the false colors at the bottom of the render. Okay, now let's close the flyout menu and head to the settings tab. Here, I'll switch the interactive mode off, and set the time of day a bit earlier, so that the sun is lower in the sky and more light can enter in through the windows. I'm going to try a production render with the time set to 9am and see how that looks. Note that the lighting analysis will also work in interactive mode, but it will typically be used in production rendering. Okay, when the render is done, Let's head over to the Lighting Analysis Render element and take a look at the results. You will see a color representation of Lux values for that time of day and location. You'll see that the light coming inside is much more drastic, allowing you to easily analyze daylight or artificial light sources. Alright, now let's close the VFB, and we're going to move the Asset Editor over. And turn the Shadow Display back off again, as well as set the time back to 1035. Next. Let's head to the Lights tab, and I'd like to switch the lighting in the scene to Dusk. To achieve this, I'm going to use an HDRI instead of the Environment Sky. First, let's turn off the sunlight here, then select the Dome Light, and let's enable the Texture tab using Control click Now, if I open the right-hand Flyout menu, I can drag an HDRI bitmap I already have in my scene, and drop it into the Dome Light's Texture Swatch as an instance. You'll see as the live preview updates here that this HDR will provide us with a nice warm sunset lighting scenario. Before starting a render, let's also switch the dome light's shape to sphere so that the projection of the HDRI goes below the horizon. Alright, now I'll close the flyout menu here and move the asset editor over to the left so we can start an interactive render. Now, 
And as you can see clearly from the preview here, the dome light's brightness is set to low, so I'm going to increase it to 30. Once again, we'll also get a clean preview here very quickly thanks to the AI denoiser. Okay, I like how this looks so far, but I also think it feels a bit too warm for my taste. Let's tweak the white balance a bit now to explore some different tones we can achieve here. In the settings menu, let's drop down the camera options where you'll see that we can adjust the white balance. If I click on the color picker, I can easily choose from a range of colors to quickly set the white balance to my liking. For example, Making the white balance a warm color will make the color of the light appear a bit cooler and more neutral in my render, creating a soft early evening ambience. Okay, now let's close the frame buffer and then the shadows tray on the right. Next, in the layers tray, let's make the lamps layer visible in our scene here so that we can add some artificial lighting to use with the lamps above the table. However, before we go any further, I'd like to demonstrate how you can use some of the new redesigned lighting features available in V-Ray Next to streamline your workflow. Let's hop over into a different scene that I've specially prepared to discuss these lighting options in more detail. Okay, I've got a scene set up here with a bunch of different V-Ray lights arranged already, which you can see if I rotate around a little bit. To get started, let's go ahead and click on the Enable Solid Widgets icon at the top here, which enables the use of faces for the viewport widgets. You can see as I click it that it toggles the faces on and off for the various lights in the scene. This makes it easier to see and place lights in the viewport, especially when working with lots of lights in a scene with lots of geometry. Next, I can use the Hide V-Ray Widgets option, which hides all of the widgets in the scene. This way, if you want to take quick screenshots to use in a presentation, you can very easily hide all of the V-Ray specific objects from the viewport, without affecting the render result. Together, these tools can be used to create a smooth project export from SketchUp to Layout. Okay, now in the Asset Editor, let's open the Flyout menu to the right, and I'm going to show you how you can quickly and painlessly get a sense of each light's contribution to your scene. You'll see that we have the sunlight selected, and that the Live Swatch preview on the right automatically displays the sun's lighting without having to render anything. If I click on the other lights available here, you can see that they also display live previews. This makes it incredibly easy to make adjustments to the lighting in advance so that you can spend less time waiting on a render only to find out that the light doesn't work well in the scene. I'm going to make a few adjustments now to my V-Ray Spotlight's cone and penumbra angles just to demonstrate how easy it is to get a quick feel for its light contribution. Let's see how we can make adjustments to the sphere light as well. I can change the size as well as the intensity or even change its color. Again, this will work for any of your lights in the scene giving you a detailed sense of the lighting results you'll see before you ever even press the render button. In addition, we've also made tweaking lights easier than ever. Now using the Scene Interaction tool, you can hover over a light right in the viewport and quickly make adjustments to its intensity in the scene, simply holding the left mouse button and dragging the cursor up or down. You can see in the Live Swatch preview how much brighter the light has become as well. Dragging down will lower the light's intensity or even let you turn it off, which again you can monitor in the Live Swatch preview. Note that the Live Swatch preview is also clamped in an intelligent way in order to prevent displaying over bright previews in the swatch. You can also make these adjustments while rendering interactively so that you can adjust your lights quickly from the viewport and see how it looks. All right, now let's return back to our kitchen scene again and explore how to add artificial lighting when working with interior scenes. Okay, back in the Asset Editor, I'm gonna open the Lights tab and click the icon here to turn it on. Next, I'm going to open the right end flyout menu, and let's tweak the size a bit to find something that works well for this scene. Notice how when I tweak the size, the wireframe display also increases or decreases in the viewport. Alright, this size feels about right for our scene here. Next, I don't actually want to see the raw light sources directly, but instead I want to create a warm glowing effect in the spherical lampshade surrounding the lights. To achieve this, I'm going to drop down the options menu here and check the invisible checkbox on. And now you'll see that the raw light disappears in the Live Swatch preview. I also want these lights to be a bit warmer in tone, so I'm going to go back up here to the color picker and set them to a slightly orange color. All right, now let's close the flyout menu and go ahead and start an interactive render.
As you can see here as the denoiser kicks in, the sphere lights are now adding a nice ambient glow to the hanging lampshades, as well as adding just a tiny bit of additional light to the table and surrounding areas below. Okay, let's close the frame buffer. And now in the Layers tab, I'm going to make a layer called Blocker Visible in order to create a different lighting scenario simulating dusk or evening light. If I move over and rotate a bit here, you'll see that the blocker is basically just an additional wall, which makes it so that we have less light coming inside from the dome light. Now I'll switch back to the main scene perspective and click the icon to turn off the sphere lights to emphasize the evening light. Next, in the settings, let's toggle off the interactive mode and this time do a production render. And as expected, we have a warm dusk light setup now thanks to the addition of the blocker geometry. However, the scene is a bit too dark now, and I'd like to make it feel a bit more balanced. Traditionally, we would need to play with the exposure and white balance manually, making incremental tweaks until we find values that work pretty well for our scene. In Viri Next, we've implemented new algorithms so that getting a properly exposed and or white balanced image is now as easy as clicking a button. You'll find these new features down in the camera section of the render settings. Next to the exposure value option, I can simply switch on the auto mode to change it from manual to automatic. I'll also do the same for the white balance so that both the exposure and white balance are corrected. Now let's hit the render button again and see how it looks compared to our previous result. Note that in order to use the auto exposure and white balance features, you'll need to render in production mode specifically for now. You'll see immediately as the denoiser kicks in that the scene appears much brighter, and the tone is overall much more neutral with more white light complementing the warmer colors. To make this a bit clearer, I'm going to select the Render Region tool up here and draw out a render region on the left hand side of the image so that only this area will be rendered when I press the render button again. Now back in the camera settings, you'll see that there's a slider for compensation. This is available when the auto exposure mode is on and allows you to manually compensate for the automatically calculated exposure. A value of negative 1, for example, makes the result twice as dark, meanwhile a value of 1 makes it twice as bright. I'm going to leave this setting at 0.3 and then start another render so that you can see how it compares on the left to the previous render we did on the right. Again, as soon as the denoiser kicks in here, you can see that the result is noticeably brighter. If I turn off the render region, you can see the lighting differs quite noticeably, even in less pronounced areas such as on the floor, table, and ceiling. Okay, let's close the frame buffer now and prepare for a final production render. First, I'm going to go ahead and increase the quality slider in the render settings to high, close the camera menu, and then let's pop open the right hand flyout menu here and drop down the denoiser settings. For production rendering, we recommend switching back to the default Vira denoiser as it delivers more accurate results than the NVIDIA AI denoiser. This is especially important for the final image. Now, you might be wondering, how can I render multiple scenes if I want to render more than one? For example, in this case I'd like to render not only my final scene, but also a close-up of the apples on the table. In Vira Next, we can achieve this easily by doing a batch render, which will render each scene that I've selected for batch rendering in the project one at a time. In order for batch rendering to work correctly, it's important that we first specify the file path where the renders and elements will be saved. To do so, drop down the render output settings and make sure to toggle on the save image option here. This allows us to specify a file path and file format for saving the production batch renders automatically. Okay, now that I've got that set, let's close the render output settings and go ahead and do our final render. Before starting the batch render, Let's also double check which specific scenes to render by dropping down the scenes tray. In this case, I want to render the final scene, so let's scroll down and make sure to check the include an animation box, which will include it in the batch render. I'll also do the same for the close up apples scene, which I want to include as well. Now, if I press the batch render button, it will render a batch that includes both of these scenes, but omits any scenes that don't have the include an animation box checked. V-Ray will then iterate through rendering the scenes I've selected automatically. When they're done, each scene will be a separate render, located at the file path we set in the output settings. Before moving on, I'll also show you two separate production renders I created, 
with the main scene here under different lighting conditions, one at dusk and the other during the day. All right, let's now explore an exterior scene I have set up to demonstrate the enhanced power and capabilities of GPU rendering in V-Ray Next for SketchUp. We've made the workflow incredibly fast and easy to set up your scene for GPU rendering now, and with the added new GPU production features such as rendering volumetric fog, you can now get stunning looking images at faster speeds than ever before. To start, let's open up the Asset Editor and double check that our render settings are set to the GPU engine and that we're rendering on interactive mode and turn on the Denoise toggle, which enables the Denoiser render element. Once again, let's switch the engine over to the NVIDIA AI Denoiser so that we can get the fastest possible preview. OK, and next let's make some adjustments to the render output settings. First, I'll switch on the Safe Frame mode. This will toggle on a visual frame overlay in the viewport if there is a difference in aspect ratio between the viewport and the output image size. I'm also going to switch the aspect ratio mode to Custom. In V-Ray Next, instead of being permanently locked to a specific aspect ratio, you can click here on this chain icon to unlock the image width and height and input custom values for each. This allows us to experiment with the image size without needing to know the aspect ratio in advance. Thanks to the combined power of GPU rendering and the new AI denoiser, the IPR interactivity is more responsive than ever. To demonstrate just how quickly we can work on our scene on GPU, I'll switch to a couple other perspectives that I have set up here just so you can get a feel for how fast the interactive preview is in V-Ray Next. For example, we can take a look at the side of the house over here on the left, or we can switch to a close-up perspective of these outdoor lawn chairs, and switch to another angle from the right side of the house again. Notice how fast the preview updates, which makes it easy to make decisions and adjustments to our scene much more quickly. OK, now let's return to our original scene. Next, I'm going to open up the Asset Editor once more, and let's go to the Lights tab and take a look at our lighting setup here and see how we can explore a variety of different options in just a few clicks. First, let's disable the sunlight here. Then, I'll enable the V-Ray Dome Light. Notice how we now have some clouds appearing in the sky thanks to the Dome Light's HDRI, which I had set up in advance for this scene. I'm also going to enable the V-Ray Sphere Light setup here, which will turn on some lights inside the house. Now, let's click the Dome Light drop-down arrow and select the bitmap texture. Alright, you'll see that we have an HDRI loaded in here. Let's drop down the Texture Placement menu and make some adjustments to the horizontal rotation. Let's try 90 degrees. You'll see that the HDRI texture rotates in the interactive preview and gives us very fast feedback, making it incredibly simple to try out different positions for the clouds and lighting without any hassle. Now you've seen just how quickly you can preview different lighting results using the power of V-Ray GPU. OK, I'm going to stick with the rotation at negative 20. Now, back in the Settings tab, let's explore adding some volumetric effects to our scene. In V-Ray Next, you can now take advantage of V-Ray's powerful environment fog on the GPU so that you can render incredibly realistic lighting conditions at faster speeds than ever before. Let's switch the type over to Environment Fog, which can give us added realism and additional control parameters. Right away, you'll see that the effect is much more pronounced, creating a realistic sense of mist in our scene. I'm going to make some adjustments here to the height and distance parameters, just so you can get a feel for how this effect can change the atmosphere. For example, if I increase the distance, the effect becomes softer and more subtle. I can also change the color, which affects how the fog appears when it is illuminated by light sources. Let's add a light hint of blue here to make the image a bit cooler. OK, I'm liking how that looks, so let's close the flyout menu. Next, I'm going to click on the lens icon here to open up the V-Ray lens effects. In V-Ray Next, the lens effects have been redesigned to simplify the interface and make it easier to quickly add powerful camera lens effects like bloom and glare to your renders. Simply clicking on this checkbox will enable the effect. It's a bit subtle right now, so let's increase some of the settings to give you a better idea of how these work. If I increase the intensity and then the size here, you can see that the lights coming from inside the house are starting to glow and blend outwards beyond the edges of the walls around them. Below here, there are also some other options like adjusting the number of visible blades from the lights, 
that you can experiment with in your own scenes as well. You also notice that there are modes to affect only the final rendered image or generate a separate render element as well. You can find the lens effects by switching over to the glare render element. All right, now let's close the lens effects. Okay, I'm happy with how this is turning out, so let's prepare to do a production render. I'm going to turn off the interactive mode and then switch off the progressive option as well so that we can take advantage of bucket rendering on GPU. This is a new feature in V-Ray Next that can improve your swarm rendering performance by providing better render node utilization. It can also be helpful for cutting down on network traffic and slightly decreasing memory usage. Now that you've seen how it works, to save us some time, I'm going to pull up a completed bucket render on GPU that I already saved from earlier. And there you go. Now you've seen how you can use the power of V-Ray Next's GPU render engine to get blazing fast render previews and stunning production results right out of the box. In addition, with V-Ray GPU, we have also now added support for material refraction dispersion for emulating the separation of light into different colors as seen in prisms or diamonds. We also now support using VR scan materials on GPU, which give you the option to utilize more than a thousand photorealistic scanned materials all while harnessing the power and speed of your GPU. Okay, hopefully by now you've seen how Viri Next's improved workflow, smart new tools, and faster rendering capabilities on both CPU and GPU can deliver you stunning looking results. You'll save time using the new Asset Library Manager and options like spline curves for editing materials, and make decisions more quickly thanks to the faster IPR and new tools like the NVIDIA AI Denoiser. V-Ray Next can also speed up your workflow and render speeds without any extra effort, thanks to new tools like the Adaptive Dome Light and the Auto Exposure and Auto White Balance options. You've also seen how V-Ray Next's new GPU production features can help you render incredibly fast production images. In addition, you can sign up at any time for the seamlessly integrated Chaos Cloud service, so you can harness the power of a supercomputer for all of your rendering needs. If you'd like to try out V-Ray Next for SketchUp, Please visit our website, chaosgroup.com, for more information and to download a free trial. And if you have any further questions, please feel free to check out our docs page for additional information about these new features. For the latest updates, click subscribe on our YouTube channel, Chaos Group TV, for more videos about new products and releases. Thank you for joining me for this webinar session, and I hope to see you next time.